There is the uh, familiar door of the White House through which Mr. Bush and the Reagans and Senator, soon to be Vice President Quayle, went just a short while ago. We are now waiting for them to come out and go to the Capitol together. This overall inaugural ceremony will last about an hour and a bit, uh, and they will leave from the White House quite soon. David, they've done all sorts of things. Uh, Professor Graff was mentioning the animosity between uh, at, at transition in the past. There's none of that here. No, because, you know, they've been together for eight years. They're old friends. The uh, deepest animosity I recall was uh, Truman and Eisenhower. Eisenhower, running for president, said if elected, he would go to Korea, meaning he would try to end the war, which was highly unpopular. After the election, Truman sent him, a, I, I think, a telegram saying, if you still want to go to Korea, we will arrange it with airplanes and so on. It infuriated Eisenhower because it was suggesting that it was an empty campaign gambit and not an honest promise. He did go to Korea, but he hated Truman for saying that. Let's pause in our conversation for a moment and listen to the congressional chorus on Capitol Hill as we watch... of the Congressional Chorus on the west front of Capitol Hill, made up of uh, people who work on Capitol Hill, no elected politicians to the best of my knowledge, but legislative aides and people who work in various committee staffs up there. There's a whole extra well, you social have to be life able, You have to be there. able to sing. It helps. <laughs> on Capitol Hill and as uh, as we wait for Mr. Bush and Mr. Reagan and their families and Mr. Quayle to leave the White House let's bring in another voice from both the present and the past ABC's chief foreign correspondent Pierre Salinger who many Americans already know was at one time the press secretary to President John F. Kennedy Pierre talk a little bit if you will about the past as we watch goings on here. Pierre's in London today about what it's like in the White House at a moment like this. Well, Peter, obviously uh, today brings back many memories of uh, 28 years ago, the day of the inauguration of John Kennedy. And I think a couple of things that have been said so far this morning are very important. First of all, the transition period is extremely important. You elect a president, but then people say, I mean, what kind of a president is he going to be? And you start to judge him during this uh, period uh, between the time he's elected and the time he becomes president. Uh, that has been a very, very major asset for George Bush, apparently not only in the United States, but here abroad. Uh, here abroad, people are taking a new look at George Bush since the election after a very negative look during the campaign of 1988. Speaking uh, the other thing sorry. That, yes. No, I apologize. Go ahead. Well, the other thing I think that's interesting was the discussion about communications. Uh, I agree that Ronald Reagan is probably the greatest communicator that's ever been president, but certainly the best press secretary, uh, press conference president was John Kennedy, and he had an easy way that he did it. And I agree with Britt Hume saying that we're beginning to see a parallel between the way George Bush is handling the press and the way that John Kennedy did. And one thing, one thing more that George Bush has already said that John Kennedy wanted to do but never got away with was to have a private life while he was president, go out to dinner, go out and see his friends, go out to restaurants. Uh, Kennedy wanted to do that too, but got very fastly cut off by the press and said he couldn't do it. So we'll see if George Bush can get away with it. I, I'm not sure. Can we talk to Sam Donaldson at the moment? Because, Pierre, I want to go to Sam with a follow-up on there. You talk about uh, President Kennedy and Vice President Bush being adroit with the press. 
I think the press appreciates that, but Sam, all this hollering that went on between you and President Reagan and others worked for you to some extent, but also worked to the president's advantage in many cases, didn't it? And well, there you involved the public more, Sam. Well, you know, I covered Jimmy Carter for four years, and I never yelled at Jimmy Carter. Why? Because Jimmy Carter came close, and he answered questions when he chose to. When he didn't, he didn't. Ronald Reagan didn't come close, and Peter, reporters had two choices to remain quiet and silent like good little boys and girls and not try to question the president of the United States, which I think is our job, or to raise your voice. Now, I predict that you're not going to have to shout at George Bush because he's already promised and so far in the transition has demonstrated that he's willing to have more frequent access with reporters. Sam. And he's willing to talk to them. Here comes the uh, President Reagan, of course, and uh, President-elect Bush now having finished their coffee in the blue room inside. President-elect Quayle or rather Vice President-elect Quayle, they're leaving for the Capitol. And there, of course, you hear some reporter shouting at President Reagan. Well, you see, the alternative, again, is, is to not to try to get the news. Now, if, if Mr. Reagan had never answered, I think we'd have stopped shouting. But he did answer, and we often got important stories from him because we ask him questions. The congressional delegates have all, delegation has already gotten in the cars. There, are, uh, there is uh, Mrs. Reagan, Mrs. Bush. There's a long motorcade lined up here on the on the north uh, driveway. And there is, as a in all of those cars, of course, the congressional escort uh, for the Quails. Each individual person, as we'll see when they get to Capitol Hill, Mrs. Quail, Vice President-elect Quail. Both Bushes have their congressional escorts who will be with them throughout this ride. But even, David, the ride of the two presidents has its own tradition, doesn't it? One sits on the right going and one sits on the right coming back. Yeah, they do that. The, um, the fact here is that the um, dignitaries in these cars are the guests of Congress. The Congress puts on the inaugural, builds the platform, does all serves the lunch does all of that so they are guests of the u.s congress and the congress has sent up cars and sent up escorts to bring them up to be sworn in it it mattered more when they were still able to use convertibles now you can't really see who's sitting on which side because the cars are all closed this is of course a new car that uh, president bush is going to use it cost i think about six hundred thousand dollars and one of the things it does have in it is better windows so that hopefully there'll be a better opportunity to see the president we'll talk about the current length but you know when i asked one of the bush transition team some days ago why not use the convertible this time it was a fairly obvious question i guess he said we don't have any more convertibles because the secret service is delighted to get rid of them there's never an option now for a president to ride in an open car i, I doubt you'll ever see a president in a convertible again for the reason that need not even be discussed is too vulnerable. They're going to have lights inside the car, so when the president rides by, you can see it. We mentioned a little earlier that there are a couple of hundred members of the uh, Bush and the Bush Walker family here for the inauguration on Capitol Hill. Britt Hume is with one of the closer relatives. Britt? I'm standing with uh, George Bush's son, George, and we're watching on television as the uh, limousine heads up here. You saw your dad earlier today and spent some time with him. Can you describe his spirits? Well, Brett, he's uh, remarkably calm. He's a, uh, a man who is in about an hour is going to be the president of our country. Didn't seem the least bit nervous. Saw him at breakfast in his pajamas, same pajamas he wore about two years ago, I think. 40 and, uh, and, and maybe about another thousand who are claiming their family members. It's amazing what a victory will do in politics. <laughs> it seems hard to enlarge that group. Uh, people here on the uh, Hill, whom I've been talking to about the inaugural ceremonies past, say that no one has ever had a contingent of family this large. And I understand that down at Blair House yesterday, it was quite a scene. Can you describe it? Well, it was. We've got uh, 24 of us uh, staying there, 22 of us staying there. And uh, as you know, the Blair House has got kind of a formal setting to it. And wonderful people carrying trays full of drinks and stuff. And, and these boys were uh, totally surrounded by 10 screaming grandkids. That, um, that I think brought the whole scene down to earth. Now, I'm told there were toys all over the floor. Toys, tractors out in the uh, patio, people riding little three-wheelers and kids screaming and mothers hollering and 
but uh, all in all it was a great and, time and in the middle of it all I'm told your mother was engaged in a game of Simon Says that's with her right. grandchildren that's is that right. true and she lost she lost. <laughs> she lost all right gentlemen there you have it the scene at Blair house yesterday with the Bush Army hottest news of the day Britt thanks very much and we will go with that official count 240 Bush relatives here according to George Bush Jr. 22 of whom stayed at Blair House. Most of the others stayed at a small hotel here in Washington. And they are having a whale of a time traveling around town in a couple of buses. Back up on the hill, Jeff Greenfield. Yes, I wanted to just add one point about the relative communication skills of Bush and Reagan. You remember in Reagan's farewell, he said, well, I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things. We ought never to forget in our process-oriented coverage that Ronald Reagan came to the presidency with a relatively coherent ideology, one of the more ideological presidents we've ever had. George Bush, by his own admission, is much more a fellow who is a hands-on, less ideological president. I always thought one of Ronald Reagan's great supports was in times of crisis, he had an army of true believers who had wanted him to be president for 20 years because of what he would do. My biggest doubt, if that's what I can call it at this celebration, about George Bush is, since he has never defined clearly and firmly an agenda, when he gets into political difficulty, will he have that core of support in the country that enables him to override tough political times? And I think that's a very big question left open about the Bush administration. Jeff, I'd also like, again, one more comment as we watch this, uh, this procession from Pierre Salinger. Pierre, eight years ago, um, I was sitting in the chair you now occupy, and I remember Europeans belittling Ronald Reagan like nobody's business. And now they watch him hand over power here today uh, with enormous affection, don't they? That's absolutely true, Peter. Uh, eight years ago, when uh, he became president, he had come out of an election where the Europeans thought it was a joke in the United States. I mean, the Americans must have been crazy, they thought, to elect an actor president of the United States. But his uh, uh, policies and the way he conducted the presidency and his communications efforts uh, gradually grew up here in Europe and brought him great strength. And as a matter of fact, when he ran for re-election the first time, a poll in France showed, a country which did not like him at all, uh, that if he'd run there, he would have won by a wider margin than he had in the United States. It showed that he had, he had uh, really achieved uh, a big success in the European community. Now, he did lose some things with the Iran gate. He lost a lot uh, with uh, the Reykjavik summit because the Europeans were more concerned about that than Iran gate, that he went so far in trying to make a deal with Mikhail Gorbachev without at all consulting his European allies. But I would say that today he leaves the presidency seen as the most popular president of the 20th century, a man who imposed a lot on the United States and on the rest of the world. And uh, I think that uh, his image changed in those eight years, as you said. And, Pierre, I don't know if you saw the results of our own poll last night, uh, but it finds that President Reagan leaves office with the highest popularity rating in the country as a whole since Franklin Roosevelt. And George Bush comes to office, David Brinkley, with the highest popularity rating he's ever had. I suppose that's not unnatural at this moment. Well, it's the beginning of an administration, a country, and for the most part, there are exceptions, for the most part, is prosperous. There's no war, there's no threat of war. In fact, there's a possibility of peace, and people generally feel pretty good. And when the president is in office at a time of general public happiness, they attribute some of it to him. That was a glimpse of the National Gallery, which tells us this motorcade is about two-thirds of its way towards Capitol Hill, and as we watch, let's listen again or actually listen for the first time in this case to our bureau chief in Moscow, Walter Rogers. Walt, give us a quick impression about how the Soviets feel about the transition. Peter, Peter, the most interesting thing was just on Soviet television a few minutes ago. The Soviets admitted that they have badly misjudged Ronald Reagan. They prefer to ignore his first term in office. They like his second term. But I find it fascinating that after calling him originally a Philistine and a mental midget, they now say they've misjudged him. They like him. Clearly that, Walt, has something to do with the fact that Ronald Reagan gives the appearance of having changed himself so much towards the Soviets. That's true, Peter, but remember the Soviets have changed. During Mr. Reagan's first term in office, he had to deal with sick men, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyanko, and the Soviets weren't capable of conducting this kind of flexible foreign policy that they are under Mr. Gorbachev. In Mr. Reagan's second term, he got very lucky. He dealt with the Gorbachev. 
Now, Walt, the Soviet press is just so much more open than it was eight years ago. We're, by the way, for your information, watching the presidential motorcade arrive at the moment on the north side of Capitol Hill itself and make its way through that uh, security maze there. One of the things you're not going to see today is a military review on the east side of the Capitol there because the military can't make its way through that security there. But there's the presidential motorcade. Very briefly, Walt, as we watch the president go in, what do they expect from George Bush or anything so far? They expect continuity, Peter. They want to build on the arms control progress that was made in Mr. Reagan's first administration. They very much want agreements on a 50% reduction in strategic nuclear weapons, an agreement on chemical weapons, and reductions in conventional weapons. Peter? Well, thanks very much. We'll come back to you. I want to go to Sheila Cast, who's standing right there outside the law library door on the east side of the Capitol. Sheila? Yes, Peter, the uh, motorcade has just pulled up. We can see uh, President-elect Bush sitting in the back seat smiling. As everyone has reported this morning, he looks very relaxed. Um, as you noted a little while ago, this uh, side of the Capitol used to be the center stage. Now it's kind of turned into the green room. That's Wendell Ford, the chairman, Senator Ford of Kentucky, the chairman of the Congressional Inaugural Committee. President Reagan getting out on the other side with Jim Wright, the Speaker of the House. Uh, they will now go into a holding President room for Reagan, a few minutes. any words for us today? <laughs> President Bush? That's Jim Wright, the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Apropos of the conversation earlier about shouting, there is a pool correspondent there who was uh, shouting the President Reagan uh, and did not get much of a response. President Reagan, any last thoughts for us today? Any last thoughts today? President-elect Bush, any last thoughts for us? You know, President no Reagan... President Reagan's a bit hard of hearing, David, as, as, as I think everybody knows, but I often wonder on occasions like that when he gives you that broad smile, convinced he's heard everything clearly and just decides to respond or not respond. Well, what can you say to a question like that at a time like this? Nothing. Quite agree. Did you have any words of advice for Mr. Ford? Oh, Wendell Ford, Kentucky, feeling? is chairman of the Rules Committee which is in charge of business about the Senate side of the Capitol, down to and including parking spaces, which may be his greatest source of power. They're all going to make their way in now to a room simply called EF-100. You caught me. <laughs> and they're going to stay in a fairly nondescript room. EF stands simply for the east front of the Capitol. There's a bathroom there. There are a couple of old prints of Washington. And this is the holding room while other members of the government, the Supreme Court, the diplomatic corps, the church, get themselves organized officially and formally on the west side of the Capitol. We're about 45 minutes away from that magic moment of noon when power passes from Ronald Reagan to George Bush, and we'll be back in just a moment. ABC News coverage of Inauguration 89 continues after this message. I want a meteor, 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 kibbles and bits and bits and bits. I said meteor, meteor, meteor. Kibbles and bits and bits and bits. No kibbles and bits and bits and bits. Crunchy meteor kibbles. Chewy meteor bits. Meteor kibbles and bits than ever before. <laughs> kibbles and bits and bits and bits. And kibbles and bits and gravy bits. Meteor. <laughs> Kids like cartoon vitamins that taste good. You want them to take a multivitamin you think is good for them. Presenting Sunkissed Multivitamins for Children, the essential vitamins kids need. I like that Sunkissed fruit taste. Sunkissed Multivitamins for Children. Gas pain, bloating. Gas X has the strongest, fastest relief ingredient. Painful gas is like beer bubbles. Add the leading ad acid. Add Gas X. Only Gas X gets rid of the gas. The strongest, fastest reliever for gas pain and bloating. Gas X. They're a couple who want one thing. I think we should have a little baby. And they only have two ways to get it. 
on just looking in the surrogacy. She's looking into adoption. Is what he wants so wrong? I want a child of my own. No, I couldn't. All My Children, weekdays. The benefits of keeping in shape. Next week, Heather Locklear, Arsenio Hall, Ann Miller, and Jennifer Holliday tell us how and why they're keeping fit. So join us for Good Morning America's special assignment, Prescription for Fitness. The west side of the Capitol. Isn't that beautiful? Like a postcard. In fact, it is a postcard. No other building in the nation so linked uh, with the nation. Out of so many comes one. And there, by the way, a semblance of this George to George, this bicentennial of the inauguration. If you look at the flags up there on the west side of the Capitol, there was a sort of evolutionary process from the flag that appeared 200 years ago. And there, down below those flags, you can see that red bunting under which the president it's on one of the colors. That's a sort of a recollection of what it was like in New York City 200 years ago as George Washington's inauguration took place. The flags across the Capitol are, just take a quick look at them again, from 1776, 1877. 13 stars. That's right. 1877. And here is sort of how the flag has changed over time. Quite astonishing. I don't remember ever seeing that one. Interesting to hear the U.S. Marine Band playing Dixie in the background. I think we had 48 states, have had 48 states longer than we have had any other number. Now, of course, 50. That's in the middle. It's pretty. You know, uh, Britt Hume was talking a while ago, Peter, about the great crowd of Bush relatives and friends who have come here today and sort of wondered how he managed to keep in touch with so many people. The answer is that George Bush is a note writer. Whenever he has nothing else to do, he sits down, writes notes to his friends and such things as a new grandchild and so on. Uh, he's famous for that, does it all the time, and uh, people like it. Maintains friendships with people that he can't see very often. Colonel John Bourgeois, the uh, present director of the Marine Band, the president's own. It played at Thomas Jefferson's inauguration in 1801, and there it is again today. Let's listen. Thomas Jefferson who gave the band the title, the president's own. There are those who think this should be our national anthem. Yes. United States Marine Band played for every president except George Washington. We'll be back in just a minute. ABC News coverage of Inauguration 89 continues after these messages and a word from our local stations. Honey, 
great news. I don't need surgery for my hemorrhoids. The doctor said they're not that serious. Well, what did he say? He told me to eat right, get some exercise, and when they act up, use Preparation H. Thousands of doctors distribute this hemorrhoidal care guide. It advises a fiber-rich diet, exercise, and for flare-ups, try Preparation H for effective therapy against hemorrhoidal symptoms. Aren't you glad you didn't need surgery? Preparation H, also a new cream. Finally, equal treatment for hands and nails. Now there's Vaseline Intensive Care Hand and Nail Formula Lotion to soften rough, dry hands and help strengthen nails with moisturizers for your hands and keratin, the protein found in healthy nails. Hand and Nail Formula from the makers of Vaseline Intensive Care because we believe in equal treatment for hands and nails. He's being really strange today. I'm dealing hey, Dad. with your Good changes. Good morning, Mom. As best I can. Morning. And though I miss the boy, I kind of like the man. So I'm enjoying the debut of that good. How's the coffee? It's really good. Good. Maxwell you gotta go. Only Maxwell mm -hmm. That's the good to the last drop. Isn't it? Magnificent. House and you. Wow. What you eating, babe? Nothing, honey. Oh, you can tell me. Kellogg's Nut and Honey Crunch. Looks good, Brad. What is it? Nothing, honey. Kellogg's Nut and Honey Crunch. When you've got the special taste of nuts and honey all wrapped up in a hearty crunch, what more can you say? Here's what. New Nut and Honey Crunch Biscuits. Crunchy biscuits of wholesome shredded wheat with that special nut and honey taste inside. Mmm, wow. Kellogg's Nut and Honey. Now in biscuits, too. Crunch. 2020 Inauguration Day, George and Barbara Bush, feisty, intimate with Barbara Walters. Read his lips. Read his lips. <laughs> Not saying that anymore. Tonight. ABC News coverage of Inauguration 89 continues. Once again, here's Peter Jennings. The nation's capital, of course, is much more than a city of uh, symbols and monuments, and it's a trouble city in many ways, but today it's a city of symbols and monuments. David, you were telling them a wonderful story about the Jefferson Memorial. The other Jefferson day. Memorial. John Kennedy was president. He was sitting upstairs in the White House, looking out over this gorgeous vista with his military aide, and this is at night. And he said to him, why is the Jefferson Memorial not lighted at night? The Lincoln Memorial is, the Washington Monument is, the Capitol is, and nobody knew. They went downstairs, got a limo and a driver, went to the, Link uh, to the Jefferson Mon uh, Memorial, and asked, nobody knew. He called the Interior Department, Park Service, and ordered them to light it, and the next night, they did. It's been lit ever since. Must have scared the unit one out of the guard. It did. <laughs> Suddenly, out of the darkness, here comes the President of the U.S. asking why there are no lights. <laughs> and, of course, if you come to this Capitol, you will see that it is lit at night. Everything you see today, with one exception, 
has to do with really evolving tradition. Senator Dole, George Bush's opponent on the primary and caucus campaign earlier, and Alan behind Cranston him, right. Alan Cranston, Senator, Senator from California, Senator Hollings from South Carolina. Who's on the right, David? No, no. That's uh, Howard Metzenbaum, Metzenbaum on the right, Ohio. from Ohio. Paul Simon from Illinois, Senator who ran very briefly for president, and in front, one of the new senators, Senator Chuck Robb from Virginia. My right, yes. Just right. elected, right? Yes. Jerry Falwell. Among the more than 100,000 people who've gathered up on Capitol Hill this morning, many of an official nature from Tennessee, Senator Al Albert Gore with a either a windswept look we haven't seen on him before. A man who ran on Super Tuesday and thought that he could turn that into a victory and fail, Senator Byrd. Sorry. Bob Byrd, West Virginia. Fiddle player. He and George Bush will have that love of country music in common. Yeah, he's a country music fiddler. And he, he plays at country music events around his state of West Virginia. Brett Hume up on the hill. Give us a sense of the uh, mood. I was just noticing up here that, first of all, it's starting to get cold up here. It's gotten overcast and the wind has picked up. There are some people here who are just in jackets with no coats, and they're going to regret that. This place is fascinating up here, uh, Peter, because it's a study in contrast. A lot of women in fur coats, a lot of people simply wearing raincoats, and there are two men standing side by side in this crowd up here. One of them is wearing a black Chesterfield coat and a black Humber. And the man immediately to his right is wearing a raincoat. And the man immediately to his right is wearing a raincoat and a safari hat with one of those famous bands that marks a safari hat, a study in contrast. <laughs> Thank you. But I also <laughs> want to acknowledge that I owe you money. I'm aware of that. Uh, it's an inside joke, I grant you. But uh, we, we, we discovered yesterday that it's only on such occasions like this do commentators use the phrase making their way in referring to people going from one place to another. I don't know why we do it. We promised we wouldn't say it, and I've said it. Well, you, you said to everybody that we've been talking to this morning, please don't say making his way. Say he walked. No, it was what? Britt Hume who said it. That's it why Brit? I lost money to Britt. All right. Britt was and mentioning a man in a black Humburg, and we were talking about pictures a little while ago, too. Tell us about the I don't have the picture. I wish I did. We saw George Bush a while ago fly fishing and wearing a sort of raunchy fishing clothes that looked as if they'd actually been used, not quite clean, and so on. There's a famous picture of Herbert Hoover fishing in the Rapidan River in Virginia, fly fishing, standing in water up to his knees, wearing waders, and wearing a black suit, a white shirt, a black necktie, and a black Hamburg hat, standing in a stream fishing. Somebody at your command is clearly scurrying around the building now well. trying to find that picture. As we go back and look at the west side of the Capitol, it, it's really Jack Kemp, Jack Kemp, another opponent of George Bush's, who's going to go in, uh, as the sign says, to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And I can't tell you much at this Ladies point about the clothing, the except Move this. Mrs. Bush, as you can all plainly see, is wearing what's described to us as turquoise. Not quite sure if you really think that is turquoise, but her outfit was designed by Bill Blass. Mrs. Quayle's outfit, David, if I've got this correct, have all been designed by students, I believe, of the Design Institute, which has, I think, a number of branches, certainly one on the West Coast and a representation here. Mrs. Bush made this wonderful presentation of herself at a, one of these events yesterday in which she said to a large crowd, and it was seen widely on television, take a look at me in my designer clothes and the makeup and everything. Look at me very closely all week, as of course we're going to do, because it may be the last time you'll see me. She wishes, apparently, to make a virtue out of, what's plainness. the word? Plainness. plainness. She's not a plain Simplicity. woman. Simplicity. Simplicity. Everything about this inauguration, as we said, is tradition except for the oath. The only thing the Constitution requires is the oath. Everything else, you were talking about President Hoover, looking at the cars go up. President Harding was the first to travel. Uh, yeah, up to Capitol Hill in a car. A Packard. Either a Packard or a Pierce Arrow. The record shows both. I don't know which is right. Maybe neither. Uh, that, that's the red bunting we've been talking about, Peter, which is put up as a sort of um, 
tr uh, tribute to the first inaugural at Federal Hall in New York City in 1789. That is the identical bunting to that over the little balcony where George Washington took the oath of office. And a famous um, engraving that we've all seen a thousand times. It's black and white, but the uh, bunting was what you see here. A lot of differences, too, of course. Martha Washington did not attend her husband's inauguration. She stayed home in Mount Vernon. When you Washington, consider the distance and the mode of travel, you couldn't blame her. Well, figure it out again for us. We were doing that uh, yesterday. Well, let's Mount see. Vernon from Washington to Mount Vernon is roughly 10 miles, 12 maybe. From Washington to New York today, I don't know about the roads then, is 225. And all of that on muddy roads and bumpy, bumpy traveling in a... Uh, horse-drawn carriage took him I think it took him eight days to get there and she didn't want to do it you can't blame her can you not at all it's one of the reasons the inauguration in those days was held in March it was because of the difficulty of travel and the time that it was felt needed for people to make their way whether to sit in the Congress or for the president to get himself organized there was even much debate on how to conduct the first inauguration. Remember, well, what, was what should George Washington be called? Some wanted to call him Your Highness, Your Majesty, that kind of thing. The President and Protector of the United yes. States. And His Elective Majesty, somebody suggested. That would, would have been the most cumbersome title in the Western world. They settled on Mr. President, period, and that's it. You were talking earlier today about, uh, about George Washington's attitude towards the first one. The Pennsylvania Senator of the day, William... McClay, I think, described uh, George Washington then as being agitated and embarrassed more than he ever was by the leveled cannon or the pointed musket. He trembled, apparently, at several times and on some occasions could hardly read. Well, he also said what has not been said since and no doubt will never be said again, that he was unfit for the office, he was unqualified, he wasn't good enough for it. That's Lewis Powell, a former... Supreme Court Justice, now retired, being applauded here. George Washington was sworn him. in by just a New York State judge. And George Bush. Well, the Supreme Court didn't exist then. George Bush will be sworn in by the Chief Justice, William Rehnquist. The Judiciary Act of 1789 set up the Supreme Court, and it called them judges only. That's all it called them. The uh, title of Associate Justice, Chief Justice, Chief Justice of the United States, which was introduced by Earl Warren. Prior to that, it was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, have all come later. There's, I think they think those are more resounding titles than judge. I keep taking a look at the Herald Trumpeters up on the balcony there. I think we're about to hear them for the first time. A little borrowing from European royalty, pageantry. Barbara Bush, married to a president, related to one. Her father, Marvin Pierce, was a descendant of Franklin Pierce, the 14th president. George Bush's mother. It is not a very glamorous route they take from that holding room on the east side of the Capitol through the crypt, which is directly under the dome, filled of Capitol memorabilia. There's the sergeant at arms of the Senate who leads them on. They go down a flight of stairs, nondescript flight of stairs, and out through a revolving door. And then when they go back, because it is on the east front of the Capitol where Ronald Reagan will say his goodbyes to Washington and to George Bush, 
they'll go back through the rotunda, that uh, glorious repository of so many things uh, in history. Very few would ever walk this route unless on his way to become president, but there's no other reason to go there. It leads to a balcony outdoors, which ordinarily is hardly ever used. The uh, parking lot and so on are on the other side of the Capitol. The subway to the Senate office buildings, the, uh, to the uh, House office building, parking garages, all of the essential factors of legislative life are on the east side. It was Professor Graff who said earlier that uh, presidents leave on time. When President Reagan leaves the east front of the Capitol today, he will be on his way to retirement in California. And there is uh, the helicopter with which we've all become so familiar waiting there outside the east front. The president will make, I guess we call it a victory lap, David, in a sense. He'll do one tour over the ellipse for one last look down. Of course, it won't be his last, but his symbolic last tour over this capital in which he has held sway for eight years. He's one of the helicopters that for eight years took him to Camp David. Okay. Marine Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. and flourishes and hail to the chief another part of our tradition it was julia tyler the wife of john tyler the 10th president of the u.s who first gave instructions for hail to the chief to be played whenever her husband made an official appearance and we all know how firmly fixed it is in the tradition of the land now i'm an old scottish air most presidents in private have said they get tired of hearing it because every time they walk through a door somebody plays it and it isn't, there, there are words to it, I think, from, from Sir Walter Scott, which hail the ch chief comes would triumphant. You, would you care to sing them, Peter? No, I don't I know who you were. I didn't know the words. I don't know, I've never heard of them. <laughs> could you just, you could feel the warmth there for the president in that applause. Well, people like him. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. They're running a little behind time up there. I don't know how they're going to figure that out because Mr. Bush has got to be sworn in at noon, 21 minutes from now. We'll be right back. ABC News coverage of Inauguration 89 continues after this message. Around here, life hasn't changed much. Pure, fresh, uncomplicated. Fresh-picked fruit is a favorite. So is Smucker's Simply Fruit. Simply Fruit from Smucker's. It's just fruit. Spreadable fruit. Purity you can taste in six just-picked flavors. Around here, we like things simple. Smucker's Simply Fruit. Every night, all over America, more people sleep on Sealy Posturepedic mattresses. How many? Well, let's see. The Smiths here have one. So do the McCarty's. The Cheney's have a Sealy Posturepedic, too. The mattress designed in cooperation with leading orthopedic surgeons. In fact, so many people sleep on Sealy Posturepedic mattresses, you can't even count them all. But you sure can spot the ones who don't. Oh, boy! Can I get that seat, please? Is this seat taken? Oh, it's crowded. Aren't you glad you used dial? We are sorry to Don't you wish everybody did? And there is Vice President-elect Quayle. I don't even know when he stopped being Senator Quayle, man. Now, already, I guess? 
Um, he has to resign from the office, and exactly when he did it, I assume he has done it. <laughs> he has I to resign. It. Yes. I missed it. I know there's a um, new senator from Indiana, and uh, I apologize, I don't know his name either. Senator Quayle has had a very busy transition time. Mrs. Quayle, of course. Strong, determined woman. She's a lawyer. A lawyer who gave up her legal practice to devote her time to her husband and her children, very active in, in the lives of her children. Is, there's, excuse me, go ahead. No, I was just going to... No, Ladies and there's gentlemen, some the Vice President-elect of the United States. Seven. She may want a job in Washington. Some sort of... Not government, some sort of private work. Mr. Quayle, for the moment, has had a very busy transition, uh, consulting all sorts of people on the role of the vice president, as best we can tell, and it's hard to tell, so it's sometimes hard to look behind the curtain in this city, as we all know, has been doing a lot of homework, consulted people like former Vice President Mondale, former President Nixon, and has said in recent days that he wants uh, his own vice presidency to be modeled on the relationship that George Bush had with Ronald Reagan. That's one proud woman, isn't it? No, she is. Actually, a briefing on the duties of the vice president would take about 15 seconds. His only duty, only duty, is to preside over the Senate, which they usually don't do anyway. Beyond that, whatever the president wants him to do, asks him to do, that's all. Britt Hume is going to move from the Senate to the White House for us, as we've already said. Britt, uh, what's the early read on Quayle from your perspective? Well, I've talked to uh, Senator Quayle, President -elect, uh, Vice President-elect Quayle, about what kind of role he would like to play, Peter, and he told me that this idea, there you see uh, the Vice President about to come out, he said that he was urged by Howard Baker to play a big role on the Hill, and then he sat down with former Vice President Mondale, who said that was a terrible idea. And I think he was more inclined to believe Mondale because, after all, Mondale had been vice president and it more or less set the tone for the activist vice presidencies that we have, we have seen since. There is still some confusion, Britt, isn't there, as to the precise motivation on George Bush's behalf in choosing Senator Quayle? Well, I think there's some sense that uh, it was done for the rawest kind of political reasons. And now, though, I think that uh, you will see exhibited by uh, President Bush a strong sense of loyalty toward uh, Quayle. He feels quite protective toward him, and I think he'll do everything he can to try to allow this man to rehabilitate himself politically. Quayle does have one advantage, uh, as surely uh, Vice President, uh, President to be Bush knows, and that is, that for better or for worse, Dan Quayle is a huge celebrity. So, so Britt, from your point of view so far of covering about to be President Bush. How does he want to use Dan Quayle? Well, I'm not sure that he's, he's too clear about that yet. I, I, he has spoken vaguely about important missions. I don't think he knows what they are yet. But I think he is very determined uh, to see that, uh, that Quayle is uh, able to undertake tasks where he'll have an opportunity to show that he is, after all, an intelligent man. And, and not someone who simply has no idea uh, about the affairs of state, which is what some people came away from the campaign feeling that he indeed is. Thanks, Britt. The first funeral, and it usually is a vice presidential trip, the first funeral will be the Emperor of Japan and yeah. President Bush will be going to Manhattan. Yeah, that's a big one, so I, I suspect that uh, while Vice President Quayle may be there, he won't be Ladies the main player. The that's Vice just... President of the United States. <laughs> Trumpeter, we haven't seen him close up before. Now, 
another small piece of tradition saying hello to his mother very gritty lady mrs bush not in the absolute pink of health mm. nevertheless george bush looks like her yeah very much so and again that gentleman you keep seeing back and forth uh, with the uh, bush and everybody else is the uh, sergeant at arms and there you see it. George Bush is not going to have this. If we could take one more look at that. Poor George Bush this morning is not going to have a chance to, to see this wonderful vista. Because smack in front of him is the biggest darn platform with television cameras on it. You television, television reporters, so on. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, and my fellow Americans, on behalf of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, Welcome to the Bicentennial Presidential Inauguration. Senator Ford. It's now my pleasure to present for the invocation the Reverend Billy Grimm. Will everyone please rise? Wendell Ford, Kentucky, Chairman of the Rules Committee, which is in charge of events Shall like this. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, thou hast said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We recognize on this historic occasion that we are a nation under God. This faith in God is our foundation and our heritage. Thou hast warned us in the Holy Scriptures, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We confess that we're in danger of destroying some of those foundations. For at times our faith in thee has faltered, and we've chosen to go our own way rather than the way that thou wouldst have us go both as individuals and as a nation. Forgive us, we pray, as we turn to thee in repentance and faith. Restore us to thyself and create within us a desire to follow thy will for all our lives. As George Washington reminded us in his farewell address, morality and faith are the pillars of our society. May we never forget that. The scripture also says, promotion comes not from the east nor from the west, but from thee. We acknowledge thy divine help in the selection of our leadership each four years. We recognize, O oh Lord, that in thy sovereignty thou hast permitted Ronald Reagan to lead us for the past eight years. We pray that as he and his wife, Nancy, leave the White House and go to the West Coast, that thou wouldst give them many more years of health and happiness. And now we come to a new era in our history. In thy sovereignty, thou hast permitted George Bush to lead us at this momentous hour of our history for the next four years. As he today places his hand upon the Bible and solemnly swears before thee to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, give him the wisdom, integrity, and courage to help this become a nation that is gentle and kind. Protect him from physical danger and in the lonely moments of decision, grant him thy wisdom to know what is morally right and an uncompromising courage to do it. Give him a cool head and a warm heart. Give him a compassion for those in physical, moral, and spiritual need. O oh God, we consecrate today George Herbert Walker Bush to the presidency of these United States with the assurance that from this hour on, as he and his family move into the White House, they will have the presence and the power of the one who said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We pray that thou would bless his wife, Barbara, and his children as they stand at his side, and his mother who is here today. And what we pray for President Bush, we also pray for Vice President James Danforth Quayle and his wife, Marilyn, and their children. We pray as well for the members of the cabinet, the, the Congress, the courts, and all others whom thou hast entrusted with positions of leadership. We pray that the spiritual tide that many of us have sensed running in this nation may continue. As we read our newspapers and watch our television screens, it seems that evil is getting worse. But we thank thee for the millions of people that pray daily and go to church and synagogue on the weekends. We believe that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All this we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Reverend Billy Graham, he's now 70. It's now my special pleasure to introduce the Harlan Boys Choir from Harlan, Kentucky, under the direction of Mr. David Davies. They will sing, This is My Country. Southeastern Kentucky, the Harlan Boys Choir, 76 of them from fifth grade to seniors in high school. A little town where the choir represents the town's pride. gave the lie to, to Sissy to be in choir. The basketball star and the high school quarterback are both. It is now my pleasure to present my Everybody distinguished in colleague, County, Kentucky. the Honorable Ted Stevens, of Senator kids. of Alaska, to introduce the Vice Presidential Oath and the Presidential Oath. Senator Stevens. Thank you, Chairman Ford, for your many courtesies. President and Mrs. Reagan, Vice President Mrs. Bush, fellow citizens. The Vice President-elect will take his oath of office as his wife, Marilyn Tucker Quayle, holds the Quayle Family Bible. Their children, Tucker, Benjamin, and Corinne, will join them. The Vice President-elect has asked a gracious lady, the first woman to sit on the highest court of our land, to administer his oath of office. 
It is my honor to present now the distinguished Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Sandra Day O'Connor, who will administer the oath of office to the Vice President-elect, James Danforth Quayle. Justice O'Connor is the first woman to swear in a Vice President, and the oath is the same one that he took when he was sworn in as Senator. I, James Danforth Quayle. I, James Danforth Quayle. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely freely without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion that I will well and faithfully discharge that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office the duties of the office on which I am about to enter on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations the history of the vice president's oath is a good deal longer than the president's. Also quite worded. <laughs> Another little piece of tradition. Lady Bird Johnson was the first wife to hold the Bible for her husband swearing in, and now all wives do it. And as you correctly pointed out a moment ago, David, Vice President Johnson became President Johnson, sworn in by a woman, but this is the first time a... a vice president. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's some, uh, I don't know what Bible they're using. I've heard both and I don't Staff know which is right. Albie Powell of the United States Army Band will now sing, God Bless America. There was the Bush Family Bible or the Bible used by George Washington, which is owned by a New York Masonic Temple. I don't know which one it is. Alvie Powell, by the way, was specifically requested by Mrs. Bush to sing. She loves his voice. He's well known. He's 33. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swell that's free let us all be grateful for land so fair as we raise our voices in a song America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. From the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home.
Thank you, Staff Sergeant Powell. Ah, standing ovation. <laughs> President Reagan, Vice President and Mrs. Quayle, fellow Americans, the wife of the President-elect, Barbara Bush, will hold the Bible first used at the inauguration of President George Washington together with the Bush Bible. With us today is the President-elect's mother, Mrs. Prescott Bush. George, Jeb, Neil, Marvin, and Dorothy, with their families, join their father and mother on this platform. It is now my great privilege and high honor to present the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable William Hobbs Rehnquist, who will administer the oath of office to the President-elect of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush. That Washington Bible, of course, comes from the Masonic Lodge in New York, where it was found 200 years ago, when at George Washington's inauguration, they couldn't find a Bible in a hurry. The Chief Justice, William Rehnquist. And repeat after me. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do uh, solemnly swear. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. and being fed little cheese snacks. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And so once again, three minutes after 12 Eastern time on yet another occasion, vast power willingly bestowed, peacefully transferred. Hey, Jack. Danny. Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. President, Vice President Quayle, Senator Mitchell, Speaker Wright, Senator Dole, Congressman Michael, and fellow citizens, neighbors, and friends. There is a man here who has earned a lasting place in our hearts and in our history. President Reagan, on behalf of our nation, I thank you for the wonderful things that you have done for America. I've just repeated, word for word, the oath taken by George Washington 200 years ago. And the Bible on which I place my hand is the Bible on which he placed his. It is right that the memory of Washington be with us today, not only because this is our bicentennial inauguration, but because Washington remains the father of our country. And he would, I think, be gladdened by this day, for today is the concrete expression of a stunning fact, our continuity, these 200 years since our government began. We meet on democracy's front porch, a good place to talk as neighbors and as friends, 
For this is a day when our nation is made whole, when our differences for a moment are suspended. And my first act as president is a prayer, and I ask you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and thank you for your love. Accept our thanks for the peace that yields this day and the shared faith that makes its continuance likely. Make us strong to do your work, willing to heed and hear your will, and write on our hearts these words. Use power to help people. For we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor a name. There is but one just use of power, and it is to serve people. Help us remember, Lord. Amen. I come before you and assume the presidency at a moment rich with promise. We live in a peaceful, prosperous time, but we can make it better. For a new breeze is blowing, and a world refreshed by freedom seems reborn. For in man's heart, if not in fact, the day of the dictator is over. The The totalitarian era is passing. Its old ideas blown away like leaves from an ancient, lifeless tree. A new breeze is blowing, and a nation, refreshed by freedom, stands ready to push on. There's new ground to be broken and new action to be taken. There are times when the future seems thick as a fog. You sit and wait, hoping the mist will lift and reveal the right path, but this is a time when the future seems a door you can walk right through into a room called tomorrow. Great nations of the world are moving toward democracy through the door to freedom. Men and women of the world move toward free markets through the door to prosperity. The people of the world agitate for free expression and free thought through the door to the moral and intellectual satisfactions that only liberty allows. We know what works. Freedom works. We know what's right. Freedom is right. We know how to secure a more just and prosperous life for man on earth through free markets, free speech, free elections and the exercise of free will unhampered by the state. For, th <laughs> for the first time in this century, for the first time in perhaps all history, man does not have to invent a system by which to live. We don't have to talk late into the night about which form of government is better. We don't have to wrest justice from the kings. We only have to summon it from within ourselves. We must act on what we know. I take as my guide the hope of a saint. In crucial things, unity. In important things, diversity. In all things, generosity. America today is a proud, free nation, decent and civil, a place we cannot help but love. We know in our hearts, not loudly and proudly, but as a simple fact, that this country has meaning beyond what we see and that our strength is a force for good. But have we changed as a nation, even in our time? Are we enthralled with material things, less appreciative of the nobility of work and sacrifice? My friends, we are not the sum of our possessions. They are not the measure of our lives. In our hearts, we know what matters. We cannot hope only to leave our children a bigger car, a bigger bank account. We must hope to give them a sense of what it means to be a loyal friend a loving parent, a citizen who leaves his home, his neighborhood, and town better than he found it. And what do we want the men and women who work with us to say when we're 
no longer there, that we were more driven to succeed than anyone around us, or that we stopped to ask if a sick child had gotten better and stayed a moment there to trade a word of friendship. No president, no government can teach us to remember what is best in what we are. But if the man you have chosen to lead this government can help make a difference, if he can celebrate the quieter, deeper successes that are made not of gold and silk, but of better hearts and finer souls, if he can do these things, then he must. America is never wholly herself unless she is engaged in high moral principle. We as a people have such a purpose today. It is to make kinder the face of the nation and gentler the face of the world. My friends, we have work to do. There. there are the homeless, lost and roaming. There are the children who have nothing, no love, no normalcy. There are those who cannot free themselves of enslavement to whatever addiction, drugs, welfare, the demoralization that rules the slums. There is crime to be conquered, the rough crime of the streets. There are young women to be helped. who are about to become mothers of children they can't care for and might not love. They need our care, our guidance, and our education, though we bless them for choosing life. The old solution, the old way, was to think that public money alone could end these problems. But we have learned that that is not so. And in any case, our funds are low. We have a deficit to bring down. We have more will than wallet, but will is what we need. We will make the hard choices, looking at what we have, perhaps allocating it differently, making our decisions based on honest need and prudent safety. And then we will do the wisest thing of all. We will turn to the only resource we have that in times of need always grows, the goodness and the courage of the American people. And I am speaking of a new engagement in the lives of others, a new activism, hands-on and involved, that gets the job done. We must bring in the generations, harnessing the unused talent of the elderly and the unfocused energy of the young. For not only leadership is passed from generation to generation, but so is stewardship. And the generation born after the Second World War has come of age. I've spoken of a thousand points of light of all the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. We will work hand in hand, encouraging, sometimes leading, sometimes being led, rewarding. We will work on this in the White House, in the cabinet agencies, I will go to the people and the programs that are the brighter points of light, and I'll ask every member of my government to become involved. The old ideas are new again because they're not old. They are timeless duty, sacrifice, commitment, and a patriotism that finds its expression in taking part and pitching in. And we need a new engagement, too, between the executive and the Congress. The challenges before us will be thrashed out with the White, with the House and the Senate. And we must bring the federal budget into balance. And we must ensure that America stands before the world united, strong, at peace, and fiscally sound. But of course, things may be difficult. 
we need compromise we've had dissension we need harmony we've had a chorus of discordant voices for congress too is changed in our time there's grown a certain divisiveness We've seen the hard looks and heard the statements in which not each other's ideas are challenged, but each other's motives. And our great parties have too often been far apart and untrusting of each other. It's been this way since Vietnam. That war cleaves us still. But friends, that war began in earnest a quarter of a century ago. And surely the statute of limitations has been reached. This is a fact. The final lesson of Vietnam is that no great nation can long afford to be sundered by a memory. A new breeze is blowing, and the old bipartisanship must be made new again. my friends, and yes, I do mean friends, in the loyal opposition, and yes, I mean loyal, I put out my hand. I'm putting out my hand to you, Mr. Speaker. I'm putting out my hand to you, Mr. Majority Leader. For this is the thing. This is the age of the offered hand, and we can't turn back clocks, and I don't want to. But when our fathers were young, Mr. Speaker, our differences ended at the water's edge. And we don't wish to turn back time. But when our mothers were young, Mr. Majority Leader, the Congress and the executive were capable of working together to produce a budget on which this nation could live. Let us negotiate soon and hard, but in the end, let us produce. The American people await action. They didn't send us here to bicker. They ask us to rise above the merely partisan. In crucial things, unity. And this, my friends, is crucial. To the world, too, we offer new engagement and a renewed vow. We will stay strong to protect the peace. The offered hand is a reluctant fist, once made strong and can be used with great effect. There are today Americans who are held against their will in foreign lands and Americans who are unaccounted for. Assistance can be shown here and will be long remembered. Goodwill begets goodwill. Good faith can be a spiral that endlessly moves on. Great nations like great men must keep their word. When America says something, America means it. Whether a treaty or an agreement or a vow made on marble steps. We will always try to speak clearly. Her candor is a compliment. But subtlety, too, is good and has its place. While keeping our alliances and friendships around the world strong, ever strong, we will continue the new closeness with the Soviet Union, consistent both with our security and with progress. One might say that our new relationship in part reflects the triumph of hope and strength over experience. But hope is good, and so is strength and vigilance. Here today, are tens of thousands of our citizens who feel the understandable satisfaction of those who have taken part in democracy and seen their hopes fulfilled. But my thoughts have been turning the past few days to those who would be watching at home. 
to an older fellow who will throw a salute by himself when the flag goes by, and the woman who will tell her sons the words of the battle hymns. I don't mean this to be sentimental. I mean that on days like this, we remember that we are all part of a continuum, inescapably connected by the ties that bind. Our children are watching in schools throughout our great land. And to them, I say, thank you for watching democracy's big day. For democracy belongs to us all, and freedom is like a beautiful kite that can go higher and higher with the breeze. And to all, I say, no matter what your circumstances or where you are, you are part of this day. You are part of the life of our great nation. president is neither prince nor pope, and I don't seek a window on men's souls. In fact, I yearn for a greater tolerance, an easygoingness about each other's attitudes and, and way of life. There are few clear areas in which we as a society must rise up united and express our intolerance. And the most obvious now is drugs. And when that first cocaine was smuggled in on a ship, it may as well have been a deadly bacteria so much as it hurt the body, the soul of our country. And there is much to be done and to be said. But take my word for it, this scourge will stop. And so there is much to do. And tomorrow the work begins, and I do not mistrust the future. I do not fear what is ahead, for our problems are large, but our heart is larger. Our challenges are great, but our will is greater. And if our flaws are endless, God's love is truly boundless. Some see leadership as high drama and the sound of trumpets calling, and sometimes it is that. But I see history as a book with many pages, and each day we fill a page with acts of hopefulness and meaning. The new breeze blows, page turns, the story unfolds, and so today a chapter begins a small and stately story of unity, diversity, and generosity, shared and written together. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. From democracy's front porch, as he calls it, the president's first act is to say a prayer that he might, that we might use power to help people. about commitment and patriotism that, as the president says, finds its expression in taking part and pitching in.
a moving warm tribute at the beginning to President Reagan. Please remain standing for the benediction by Reverend Billy Graham and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Alvy Powell. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank Thee for this great day in the history of democracy. May it touch the whole world. And now may the Lord bless Thee and keep Thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon Thee and be gracious unto Thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon Thee and give Thee peace. Amen. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and the bright stars through the perilous fight for oh, the world. Parts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rapid red glare of bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. And somewhere over there in that crowd, another transition, the one we don't see, the one military aide handing to another the football in which are kept the nuclear codes. From President Reagan, his military aide, to President Bush's military aide. Somebody up, somewhere up in the back of the stand, they would not, they would not let us see it. It's a little valise. You know, when Bush rides in his new car, it's huge. He will have the ability in the back seat to set off a nuclear war. I don't know why it seems so typical, David, but Mrs. Bush just winked at him. <laughs> I just... <laughs> yeah, we have little secrets. Howard Baker. Baker. You know, Peter, we've all heard a lot of political speeches and we've all heard a lot of grandiloquent promises about wonderful performances that lie in the future. We're going to go away for 45 seconds. Don't leave. We'll be back. President Bush is about to say goodbye to President Reagan. ABC News comes... I can't get out of bed. Ever notice how even the smallest cold turns everything into a big effort? What a grab! It's time to get the big relief of Dimatap. In 12-hour Extend Tabs, Dimatap is recommended millions of times by doctors and pharmacists. So you have a cold? I've got just the thing. Dimatap. It gets things back to normal. Remember this little number. It's just 150 calories, no fat. Tastes fabulous. Hmm, plus, this little number is going to help me get into this little number. Now you can win $50,000 instantly. See package for details. President Bush 
Yeah, sure. We'll now Thank escort. Thank you very much. Well, Vice President, come on. Come on, Dan. First time you've ever used that title. <laughs> we think we are. <laughs> we are contested. Come on, Dan. There's a moving, I mean, moving on, David, for a second here from what we've seen happen to what we're about to see what happened, the, the definitive end of the Reagan era in Washington. You were talking a few days ago, it reminds me of how self-conscious John Adams felt about having George Washington even around 200 years ago because the nation wept at losing Washington and was less enthusiastic about having John Adams. Well, he knew that the country worshipped uh, George Washington and put up with him. That's really all it amounted to. And he didn't want uh, Washington around to overshadow him. Obviously, there's been no president since then who had that kind of power, but still. You know, I started to say, we've heard all sorts of promises about returning to bipartisanship in uh, foreign policy and so on. And in recent uh, decades, it has not happened. I had the feeling today that George Bush really meant it and will try as hard as he can and as honestly as he can to bring it about. It used to exist. There's no mystery about it. It ended with Vietnam when this country, half of the country turned against the other half of the country, and we've never really recovered from it. Uh, as he said, it certainly is time that we did. Were you surprised to hear him mention Vietnam and make uh, a reference to this war that cleaves us still? I guess so. It would have been very easy for him not to mention it because there's still um, hurt feelings and sore spots about it. But uh, I think that's why I think he meant it because he did bring it up. He did give the reason for the foreign policy conflict between the uh, Congress and the White House. I think he it truly means to try to stop it. I we don't should wish him luck. I don't want to give people the impression that we're going to go away for a second. But I'd like to just get some first reactions, if I may, from some of our own people and brief ones, perhaps. Britt Hume, from what you heard. Well, Peter, my sense is that this is a speech that is likely to be appreciated by a nation that does not want at this time to hear a lot of partisan political bickering. It was a speech that was very short on programmatic detail and specifics, except for the one promise, the one clear promise, I think, that uh, we heard, which was that he would eliminate the scourge of cocaine. His prescription for dealing with some of the nation's social ills appears to be a a moral call to uh, voluntarism, which is an old Republican idea into which I think uh, uh, President Bush hopes to breathe new life. He had a very nice line about it. We have more will than wallet, but will is what we need. Nice line. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how far he can go with this proposition. It's something I think in which he really believes. It, that was the old thousand points of light idea. Well, he's gone some step further to explaining his thousand points of light in terms of referring to volunteer agencies around the country. Jeff Greenfield. This, I think, was a speech that was almost a perfect pitch speech for George Bush. As you know, it was drafted by Peggy Noonan, who wrote that magnificent acceptance speech. George Bush rehearsed it with Roger Ailes, his media advisor, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. That was not publicly known. It was delivered very low key. And once again, Peter, you noticed the break with the Reagan style. He says some people see leadership with trumpets and drama. That's Ronald Reagan. This is a, a speech that's very much the Jimmy Stewart, Gary Cooper, George Bush. This is democracy's front porch. Let's have a chat. And stewardship, the Yankee as opposed to cowboy, who was Ronald Reagan. You know, uh, we are not the sum of our possessions. Stewardship is the point of giving something back. I thought it was very well crafted to say of Bush, I am not Ronald Reagan. I am my own man now. This is the tone of the national conversation that we are going to take place. It's going to be taking place over the next four years. And I think it was just perfectly In the rotunda is ABC's Jim Wooten. Jim, I sense a practical address to you. Yes, I think so. The uh, president and, uh, and Mrs. Bush are just preceding uh, President Reagan and uh, Mrs. Reagan out the east entrance of the rotunda where um, the president will leave on the helicopter. But getting back to the speech, I think it was a very, very practical speech. The interesting thing about uh, that, that I found in terms of uh, Capitol Hill is that uh, the new president turned and spoke directly to the Speaker of the House, Mr. Wright, and he turned and spoke directly to Senator Mitchell, the majority leader of the Senate. And in so doing said, uh, let's work this out, guys. The uh, people didn't send us up here to bicker and squabble. Let's get some things done. That all sounds very good. And I expect that if you talk to uh, Speaker Wright or to Senator Mitchell, what we could try to do in a moment, they would say they agree with that. When it comes down to the hard part, I expect that uh, 
there may be some more difficulties than can be seen or expressed in an inauguration speech of this tone. President Bush spoke for just a little more than 20 minutes, and you're now looking at the east side of the Capitol. Shortest speech on record ever was not quite 200 years ago. It was George Washington's second inaugural, wasn't it, maybe 135 words? Right. Roosevelt at 44 was very short. William Harrison made the longest. Just a little over 20 minutes. You know, Richard Nixon, when he was preparing his first inaugural, tried to get some sense of what theme was. He found it was almost always unity, sacrifice, confidence, and crisis. Let's just watch this for a moment. This is a good money goodbye. They will be back in Washington, of course. Visiting. Touching little scene, Peter. Claim. I just knew it would happen that they'd salute one another. Little salutes. The helicopter will take him to Andrews Air Force Base, which is about, I don't know what, 20 odd miles from here, from there. And from, from there, he'll fly to California. President Bush said it, but he really didn't need to say it because all across the country today, and President Bush went out of his way to involve people in schools and at home watching this on television to think back upon the Reagan years, as President Bush said of Mr. Reagan, thank you for the wonderful things you have done for America. That will be in some respects more readily debatable now than it has been perhaps in the last few days. There are a lot of people, David, in, in a lot of other parts of the world who don't always quite get this the way it is done with such grace and such efficiency. It's a little fanfare. Well, there is no other government like ours in the world. There are other democratic governments, of course, but they have different systems and they change... Uh, leaders when they change in quite different ways. Ours is somewhat complicated. They do have, find it hard to understand. I think it was Jim Wooten who mentioned earlier in the broadcast eight years ago, Jimmy Carter was going out, Ronald Reagan was coming in, I was in West Germany waiting for the hostages to be released, and we were talking yesterday about how sudden the transfer of power is, and recalling that passage in Hamilton Jordan's book, The Aid to President Carter, who moments after power had passed from one hand to another, phoned the operations room in the White House to see what was happening about the hostages. And he was held on hold for just a moment, and a voice came back on the line and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan, you're no longer cleared to get that information. And Hamilton Jordan writes in his book that until that moment he had no clear awareness of how suddenly power passed. Instantaneous. At the moment the oath is taken, it all changes. Yeah. 
but as uh, Professor Graff has said, one of the marvels of modern history is the American political system in which every leader has left when his time ran out, and no one ever even thought of not leaving. Professor Graff, you're watching, we're going to continue watching the president do one lap over the ellipse. What, what are you thinking at the moment? That this... Professor Graff? A call to duty, but uh, a call to unity. Uh, it uh, provided no program, but it was an appeal to the deepest and best instincts of the people by a very decent and civilized man who would like this country to shine in the world as a decent, civilized place. I was very moved. President Reagan is on his way to Andrews Air Force Base, and we shall be there when he arrives. We'll also be right back. ABC News coverage of Inauguration 89 continues after these messages and a word from our local stations. ABC News coverage of the 1989 Presidential Inauguration continues. Once again, here's Peter Jennings. The president signs, David, the cabinet documents. He's um, got a line of pens on the assumption that what they will be souvenirs that people will want. Lyndon Johnson once signed his name with about 15 pens, an L for one and a Y, half of the Y for one. And so. I remember watching it. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. As the president does this, we want to as we've said a number of times this morning, listen to some voices. In this case, with the Speaker of the House and the new Senate Majority Leader there on the President's right. Mitchell. Senator Mitchell from Maine. We want to hear from people in other parts of the world go to Moscow and London. Let us start in London with Francois Hesburgh, who is the Director of the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London. Mr. Hesburgh, did you hear something in the President's speech that uh, is going to resonate overseas? Well, I think that uh, overseas, really three words uh, will have been picked up. Reliability, compromise, and bipartisanship. Uh, and what will obviously will be watched very closely is whether the new president will be able to deliver on those words. But the tone and the forcefulness with which he spoke about the reestablishment of bipartisanship, uh, I think, will have been noted uh, very carefully. Uh, there is another aspect. Uh, which I have noted, and that is that he ta talked specifically at one stage about the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Indeed, that is the only specific bilateral relationship he mentions. It is something which will probably have been picked up in uh, Moscow. It is a recognition ab initio of uh, the Soviet Union's specific superpower status. Well, Mr. Hesburgh, you make a very good point because we have Moscow on the line. In fact, we have Gennady Gerasimov, who many Americans recognize as Mikhail Gorbachev's spokesman. What did you hear, Mr. Gerasimov, that impressed you? Well, my conclusion uh, from the speech uh, was that it's a windy day in Washington, D.C., because the president uh, mentioned uh, breezes at least four times in his speech. Uh, we do have our own breezes here. We call them perestroika. So if we understand the, his reference to breezes as uh, the wish to have a fresh start, uh, a little bit of discontinue the cause that the President Reagan had, well, we wish him well, and we hope to continue Soviet-American political dialogue and not to lose momentum. Is there any other initiative you sense in there at all? Well, uh, the, the speech is uh, mainly on domestic issues and the usual uh, Republican or maybe Democratic rhetoric, uh, but we do wish to uh, continue our dialogue and to, uh, to conserve the dy dynamism which we have in our relations. And as I understand, James Baker, who is going to be uh, the Secretary of State, talked about this dynamism, that they want to uh, return it, uh, to retain it, to retain it. Uh, Mr. Grasmus, we, uh, we transfer power in this country. 
much differently than you do in the Soviet Union? Are you impressed with That's the way we sure. do it? That's for sure. Are you impressed with the way we do it? Well, I haven't seen it on the screen, but I, I know that it's an impressive way. Yeah. You have the same Bible for 200 years. We don't have it. Thank you for taking the time, Gennady Gerasimov. That is President Reagan arriving at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington. And as he does, let us listen momentarily to our national security correspondent, John McQuethy. John, uh, President Bush mentioned the hostages. What do you think he's going to do, if anything, different from President Reagan? Any hint? Well, it's somewhat surprising that he did mention the hostages, Peter. As you remember, eight years ago, it was Jimmy Carter who had such a difficult time on this day of the turning over the power to the new administration, the Iran hostages then, of course. But uh, President Bush is going to have the same difficult problem that Ronald Reagan had, and that is what in the world to do about the hostages, to let the, let the world and let the country know that the hostages are important, but then basically to lie low on further strategy. John, you cover diplomacy for us. I am convinced I heard a clear message in that speech to Iran when President Ray, uh, Bush said, there are today Americans who are held against their will in foreign land and Americans who are unaccounted for. And then he said, assistance can be shown here and will be long remembered. Goodwill begets goodwill. Good faith can be a spiral that endlessly moves on. Possible message to Iran? It could very well be a message to Iran, Peter. I think perhaps the most important message in this speech is the message to the Soviet Union that the United States wants to continue the close relationship that has been developed over the last several years. That's a message which is heard not only in Moscow, but all around the world, because when the superpower relationship does not work, then, of course, it has repercussions all over the place. Okay, John McCarthy, thank you very much over at the State Department. In just a moment, we're going to turn this over to Sam Donaldson, who is out at Andrews. Sam, can you hear me? Two ways, perhaps, passengers. Sam Donaldson made his way from the North Lawn of the White House out to Andrews Air Force Base now because, as he pointed out earlier, he's one of a small handful of reporters who, in his case, covered President Reagan for eight years. The longest, I believe, is Lou Cannon of the Washington Post, who covered him as a governor in California and even before that. But they've been invited, a small handful of them, to go with the President and Mrs. Reagan back to California. And in case... Uh, tried and true ABC news viewers joined us late today. We're making a change of our own. Sam is going to leave covering the White House, where we've all been very proud of him, and is going to be replaced by Britt Hume, who's going to move from Capitol Hill down to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Sam, take it away. Well, yes, uh, Peter, we're at the uh, Andrews Air Force Base on any given day, surely the coldest, uh, if not the windiest place uh, in the Washington area. President and Mrs. Reagan have just arrived by helicopter and they're walking forward to a position where he can take the salutes of a combined uh, all-service honor guard. The band intends to play three numbers for him, I believe. The president, uh, former president, is not expected to speak, but of course, if he chooses to say something, everybody will listen. There's a large crowd of uh, military dependents and uh, military personnel gathered here to wish him well. You see signs in the crowd saying, we still love you both, and uh, congratulations. There they are, Nancy Reagan, former President Ronald Reagan, in front of the honor guard. Yesterday, our poll, Sam, showed that uh, the president has the highest popularity rating upon leaving office than any president since Roosevelt. Yes, I think it's as high as it was when he came into office, which is an extraordinary thing. Uh, history will debate this man's presidency, but at the moment, you can't debate the fact that he's extremely popular. Now ruffles and flourishes. Nor the last time here at Andrews for Ronald Reagan. Now what you suppose he's going to miss all this?
David, I think you were about to ask Sam a question. I was wondering how much, uh, when he gets back to Los Angeles and Bel Air, all of this will, as if by magic, disappear, and I wonder how much he will miss it. All of the ceremony and the reviewing of troops and the firing of guns and the playing of brass. Well, David, Ronald Reagan loves ceremony more than anyone I know. For instance, he loves to salute more than anyone in or out of the service that I've ever seen. You're going to see him salute, I'll bet, when he gets to the uh, steps of his plane, the military guard there. And uh, I think he'll miss the ceremony. But you know, he's told us already he's going on the uh, mashed potato circuit. He's going to speak up for causes that he believes in, and he is always going to be at a Republican dinner. So it's not as if he's going to disappear from sight. Sam, while the president is uh, reviewing this honor guard forum at Andrews Air Force Base, we can uh, perhaps have from you, George Will, some thoughts on the transition. Because it's the first time in 60 years, and actually I guess six weeks, back in 1929, in a more leisurely American age, we didn't inaugurate presidents until early March, but the first time since then that a president has been succeeded by a president of his own party in a normal inauguration. And that, in a way, the transition to the Bush administration began before the election, when Nick Brady went in at Treasury and Thornburg went in at Justice, two people compatible both with President Reagan and his chosen successor, George Bush. So this is, is as I say, a seamless transition, and one that, that I think uh, reflects the goodwill that George Bush has labored hard to create here. The theme that our foreign commentators picked up on, and that was the conspicuous stress in his speech, was on bipartisanship. I must say, Peter, it is a useful fiction, but certainly a fiction to say that bipartisanship is the American norm. It may seem that way to people who, like George Bush, came of age during the great bipartisanship of World War II. But from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, from the dealing with the Barbary pilots to fighting Mexico to the, Mex to the Cuban adventure of 1898, there has been fierce partisanship in American foreign policy, often along party lines, and there's no reason to think it will stop. But it's perfectly understandable that uh, President Bush wants to pretend that it will. George, I must say, at least from this vantage point, I sensed, however, an appetite for it in the land when the president said they didn't send us here to bicker. They asked us to rise above the merely partisan in crucial things unity. And this, my friends, is crucial. He got what I thought was his best round of applause. He certainly did, but the people may not have sent them there to bicker, but they sent a Republican to the White House, and they sent Democrats to control <laughs> the legislature, and bickering is inherent in that recipe. Very good point, George. Back to Andrews Air Force Base and Sam Donaldson. The president has just trooped the line, and now he's going to go to his plane, which, as you know, is not Air Force One because the president of the United States will not be aborted. It is simply one of the planes that the presidents use. It's 27,000, the second, the newest of the 707s that have been in service since the 60s. The president and Mrs. Reagan waving at people. Maybe we can have a word with him, maybe not. I mean, what would be Ronald Reagan going someplace without one last shouted question? Go, go have a go, Sam. Embracing members of his staff. Have a go, Adam, Sam. And people here that he's, you know, you know, they have their dog with him. Gets to go to California, I think, for the first time. How about a word, Mr. President? How about a word? Oh, no time, huh? Just tell us how you felt when the moment passed. Okay. It is a kind of windy out here in the distance. I think Mrs. Reagan looks like she might want to say a word. But no, she goes with her husband. This is Colonel Talaferris, I believe, who's the vice commander of the military district of Washington and his wife who has been designated to say goodbye. Now, let's see if I'm right or wrong. He saluted it at the bottom of the steps. When he gets on top, he'll turn around. If he follows true to form, he'll wave, and then he'll salute into the distance, and he's saluting the control tower. The people that you can't see, they're out of the picture, but he always says goodbye to them. He waves at them. 
And may I say, Peter and David, uh, since you noted that uh, we are changing in our own guard here, Rick Hume is going to take over the White House and I'm in history, just like Ronald Reagan, that I've enjoyed my 12 years there. I've appreciated the opportunity to be there. I hope I haven't vexed too many of President Carter's or President Reagan's partisans. I've tried not to, and I wish Britt Hume well. He's a terrific reporter. He'll do a great job. Well, Sam, Signing off from Andrews. <laughs> Put down that microphone, Sam. Go get on the plane. After all these years, you misread the president. He didn't salute those people in the control tower. But thanks for, uh, thanks for all of your efforts. You've done great. Executive One, it is now called, no longer Air Force One, and it's almost as if, almost as if the president had that innate sense that he was no longer commander in chief and therefore was not required or didn't feel instinctively like he wanted to salute from the top of the steps. It's interesting the president right down to today has continued to use the 707 which was the first commercial jet airliner built in this country. It was a military jet before that. However, very soon they're going to have, I think it's two, maybe three, forgotten. Two. Set two, 747s outfitted for the president. Let us uh, return at least uh, to listen to Capitol Hill as we watch the president's uh, executive one prepare for takeoff and listen again to our new White House correspondent, Britt Hume. Britt? Peter, uh, I'd first like to thank Sam for his good wishes. I'll need them. I can't imagine having a more difficult performance to follow than the one that he put in. He is a legend, probably the most famous uh, street correspondent in the history of broadcasting. As I uh, look out here on this place where just a few minutes ago, uh, the Bush family and the Senate and all of these people were seated and the president and the president-elect and all these people, as you can see, the chairs are gone. The rug is being torn up. This ceremony may have been a celebration of the permanence of our government but the trappings of the ceremony, as you can see, like so many things in Washington, are very impermanent indeed, and they will probably be out of here before nightfall. I don't know how long it will take them to tear this platform down, but it will be, uh, it will be gone very soon indeed. Well, Britt, we look forward to seeing you on the north lawn of the White House next time. Let's have a quick look inside Statuary Hall, which is where the House met at an early period in our history, where the President is going to uh, have lunch with uh, senior members of Congress and then make his way back to the White House because in a little more than an hour from now the inauguration parade is going to begin. That is uh, probably the hardest room on all of Capitol Hill in which to have a conversation. One of the reasons, David, they moved out of that room. Because it resonates and it echoes. At the lunch today, at the lunch, the inaugural lunch four years ago, they served quail, Q-U-A-I-L. Today, it'll be chicken. Uh, no one today, David, has grilled poussin. But you're quite right, chicken. <laughs> it's, uh, it says grilled poussin on the menu. Right. Want to get some final thoughts, also from Capitol Hill, uh, from ABC's Jeff Greenfield. Jeff? Well, now that the uh, transfer of power has happened, we can say what a lot of us have had on our minds. Ronald Reagan broke the jinx of the zero. Every president elected in a year ending in a zero since 1840 has died in office. Harrison, Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, Harding, Roosevelt, Kennedy. Ronald Reagan is served eight years of president, came narrowly close to dying only six weeks in, and I think every American of every partisan stripe feels a sigh of relief that that long historical jinx that's hung over our presidents has now been ended. And I think that's a nice way to begin a new administration, Peter. I've, I've never heard you mention that before, Jeff, and I'm glad you never did mention it before. What did you think of the speech? I, as I said, the uh, Bush speech, I thought, set exactly the right tone. I think that the gestures, uh, the turning to the Congress, uh, congressman, which did indeed, as someone else, and to get a big round of applause, was an attempt to claim the high ground. And we have a divided government, as we've had most of the last 35 years. And it was Bush's way of saying, I'm claiming the ground of the nonpartisan or bipartisan worker, and therefore, if there is discord, it's your fault. That was a nice little way of putting a little edge on what was otherwise a very, you'll pardon this terrible cliche, a kind and gentle speech. I, I apologize. I can't remember the last time I asked you to talk twice about a speech. <laughs> well, that's okay. It's a, long, it, it's a speech worthy of comment more than once. Well, my mind was rushing ahead to this afternoon when the inaugural parade will be seen here on ABC's in what, about an hour and uh, an hour and plus Something from now? Like when are we going to come back? Somebody tell us. Two o'clock? 
2 o'clock we're going to come back Eastern Time, about 55 minutes from now, and we will be joined on that occasion by Barbara Walters, who has been talking to President Bush and Mrs. Bush. And we hope to see you then. For David Brinkley and everybody else who's worked on this this morning, I'm Peter Jennings in Washington. We'll see you in about 55 minutes. January 20th, 1989. The inauguration of George Herbert Walker Bush, 41st President of the United States, has been a special events presentation of ABC News. ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source. 2020 Inauguration Day, George and Barbara Bush, feisty, intimate with Barbara Walters. Do you give your views on issues and do you take your views? Oh, you yes. mean to my husband? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Plus, the promise of millions in your mailbox. John Stossel on Publishers Sweepstakes. Are they for real? On 2020 Tonight.